Third Rock Ultrasound. Since 1998, Third Rock Ultrasound has presented educational programs to help clinicians integrate ultrasound technology into their patient care. Thousands of courses teaching thousands of healthcare professionals at worldwide locations. This is Module 5A, Abdominal Aortic Pathology. Hey, Pat. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to talk about next? Let's talk about pathology. Uh, what kind of pathology? Let's talk about aortic pathology. Aorta, aortas are, that's probably pretty good because most, most people have an aorta, right? Yeah, they, uh, they hope so. Okay. Most of them hope so. All right, so if you're going to tell a, a beginner about using mm. an ultrasound to look at aortic pathology in the abdomen, I mean, what, what would be the, the first couple things you would tell them about it? Well, I would tell them, first off, it's quick and it's easy and it's accurate. And that's probably three things, so I might have gone one too many. You went one too many, but still, it's a very, very important lecture, and this is a great use of ultrasound for your patients, and you can start using this very, very soon after seeing this lecture. The objectives for this module are the technical considerations, anatomy, and sonographic findings associated with abdominal aortic aneurysms and abdominal aortic dissection. Abdominal aortic aneurysm has an increasing incidence in our aging population. In patients over 65, as many as 1 in 20 will have this disease. Risk factors for abdominal aortic disease include male gender, advanced age, hypertension, smoking, a history of vascular disease, and a family history of aortic disease. There are several diagnostic imaging studies available to facilitate the diagnosis. Historically, angiography was considered the gold standard for the imaging of abdominal aortic aneurysms. However, there are many problems with using this modality, including that it visualizes only the lumen of the aorta, it underestimates the size of the abdominal aortic aneurysm, it is invasive, and it gives a dye load to the patient when renal failure is a significant risk of treatment. Finally, it's time consuming since the patient must be transported to an invasive radiology suite. Computed tomography also has limitations in that it is time consuming, requires the patient to leave the emergency department, and gives a contrast dye load to the patient. Ultrasound is the best test for the rapid detection of abdominal aortic aneurysm, and images can be generated at the bedside within minutes. In addition, the test is very sensitive for detecting aortic aneurysmal disease. The limitations of ultrasound are that it has poor ability for detecting retroperitoneal bleeding, is inferior to CT for judging the proximal and distal extent of the aneurysm, creates a tendency for novice sonographers to underestimate the aortic diameter, and also that bowel gas can block the view in some patients. The size criteria for the diagnosis of abdominal aortic aneurysm uses the following two parameters. If the diameter of the abdominal aorta is greater than 30 millimeters, or if the diameter of the abdominal aorta is 1.5 times greater than the proximal uninvolved segment. Here is an example. If the proximal abdominal aorta measures 12 millimeters and the distal aorta measures 25 millimeters, then the distal aorta is greater than 1.5 times the proximal aorta and the patient has an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Always remember that the larger the abdominal aortic aneurysm, the faster it expands over time. In addition, the larger the abdominal aortic aneurysm, the higher the risk of rupture. The majority of aneurysms involve the distal segment at or near the bifurcation of the common iliac arteries. Approximately one in three aneurysms involve both the distal and proximal abdominal aorta. If this is the case, the examiner should be very suspicious that the aneurysm extends into the thorax. There are two types or shapes of abdominal aortic aneurysms. The most common by far is the fusiform type. This type of abdominal aortic aneurysm usually tapers at both the proximal and distal extent of the aneurysm. The aneurysmal sac usually projects anteriorly and to the left. There is usually an intraluminal plaque on the left anterior wall. This image displays a longitudinal view of a fusiform abdominal aortic aneurysm. A large intraluminal plaque is seen on the anterior wall. The lumen is considerably smaller in diameter than the entire aneurysm. Here is another longitudinal view of a fusiform type abdominal aortic aneurysm. Again, the intraluminal plaque is on the anterior wall and the lumen is more posterior in location. This is a transverse view of a fusiform abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now we can see the intraluminal plaque located anterior and mostly to the left. 
Again, note how small the actual patent lumen is relative to the size of the entire aneurysm. This video demonstrates a longitudinal view of a fusiform abdominal aortic aneurysm. It is a large aneurysm measuring approximately 7 to 8 centimeters in size. This is a transverse view of the aneurysm from the previous video. You can easily see the lumbar spine posterior to the aneurysm. When Doppler color flow is applied, typically a turbulent blood flow pattern is visualized. The second type of abdominal aortic aneurysm is a saccular aneurysm. This type is much less common, making up around 1% of all abdominal aortic aneurysms. This type of aneurysm is formed by a bleb that expands out from the functional lumen and remains attached by a channel. Plaque and or thrombus can partially or completely fill the aneurysmal sac. Here is a fantastic video showing a longitudinal view of a saccular abdominal aneurysm. This video shows a longitudinal view of a saccular abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here you can see the aorta proximal to the aneurysm. This is the aorta distal to the aneurysm. When color flow is applied, you can see blood flow within the saccular aneurysm. This can often be important if you are having trouble deciding if this is a vascular structure or a non-vascular cystic lesion. This is a fantastic longitudinal view of a saccular aneurysm. The anterior aspect of the sac is filled with plaque. This is the same aneurysm as the previous video, but now we are looking at it in the transverse plane. When measuring the abdominal aorta to determine the presence and extent of an aneurysm, it is important to recall that the measurement must be from one outside wall of the aneurysm to the other outside wall. This is a common pitfall for novices who only measure the internal lumen because it's easier to see. When in doubt, make liberal measurements initially and then confirm with a more definitive study such as CT. Another important pointer regarding the measurement of the abdominal aorta is to always measure the structure in the transverse or axial plane. In this example, we see that the size of the abdominal aortic aneurysm in the transverse plane is 7 centimeters. When measuring in the longitudinal or sagittal plane, the examiner may be unaware that the beam is not directly striking the target in the anterior-posterior plane. Instead, the ultrasound signal can be directed tangential to this plane and generate a falsely low measurement. In this figure, we see how measuring the abdominal aortic aneurysm in the longitudinal plane may be accurate if the ultrasound signal is at the center of the aneurysm. But if the signal is not directly centered or if angled away from the anterior-posterior plane, it will create a falsely low measurement. So what is the utility of viewing the abdominal aorta in the longitudinal plane? First of all, it will allow you to locate saccular aneurysms that may not be in the plane of the ultrasound signal when scanning only in the transverse plane. It will also allow you to identify the proximal and distal extent of abdominal aortic aneurysms. And finally, it will allow you to look for evidence of abdominal aortic dissection. Now let's take the information we've reviewed and put them into a clinical strategy for taking care of your patients. Here are three clinical settings in which ultrasound of the abdominal aorta could be performed. The first is a patient with abdominal pain and or back pain with hypotension. The second is a stable at-risk patient with abdominal and or back pain. And finally, you can use ultrasound in every elderly patient as a screening test, particularly those patients with vascular disease elsewhere. For management of the non-ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, here is a rule of thumb. If the abdominal aortic aneurysm is less than 3 centimeters, set up the patient for serial ultrasound examinations every 6 months to follow the progression of the disease. If the abdominal aortic aneurysm is greater than 4 centimeters, obtain an outpatient surgical consult to evaluate for possible surgical repair. And if the aneurysm is greater than 5 centimeters, obtain immediate surgical consultation. Obviously, when considering this diagnosis, the clinician must consider the possibility of aneurysmal rupture. Nonetheless, the diagnosis of abdominal aortic aneurysm in patients presenting with pain is formidable. The disease is notorious for masquerading as a number of other pathologies, including renal colic, diverticulitis, gastrointestinal bleeding, myocardial infarction, and musculoskeletal pain. When the abdominal aortic aneurysm leaks or ruptures, 
it most often results in an expanding retroperitoneal hematoma and causes great pain for the patient. This location of bleeding does give some time to salvage the patient since the bleeding temporarily is controlled. In this CT image, we see an example of retroperitoneal bleeding from a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. If the aneurysm ruptures intraperitoneal, the patient usually rapidly exsanguinates. Therefore, when the abdominal aortic aneurysm is identified, the examiner should always check Morrison's pouch for evidence of free fluid in the abdomen. If free fluid is found, then the patient must go immediately to surgery. For more information regarding free fluid in the abdomen and locating free fluid in Morrison's pouch, see module number 11, Trauma Ultrasound. Let's talk about how we're going to manage these patients once we've identified an abdominal aortic aneurysm. We've broken this down into six basic steps. In the event of rupture of an abdominal aortic aneurysm, quick and efficient management is imperative to obtain the best possible outcome. If there is suspicion or evidence of an abdominal aortic aneurysm leaking or ruptured, immediately look for evidence of intraperitoneal bleeding by examining Morrison's pouch by ultrasound. Next, make sure to type and cross-match at least four units of packed red blood cells. Request at least two units of O-negative blood to the patient's bedside and move the patient to the resuscitation suite of the emergency department. Make sure to prepare the patient for immediate transport to surgery and call the operating room and anesthesia to make them aware that a patient will be coming to them shortly for emergent operative repair of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. If possible, avoid intubation. There is often a drop in blood pressure after performing rapid sequence induction and intubation that the patient may not tolerate. This is thought to be caused by the effect of positive pressure ventilation decreasing venous return to the heart. This algorithm demonstrates the decision process for managing patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm. If an at-risk patient has abdominal and or back pain, then the ultrasound should be performed looking for abdominal aortic aneurysm. If an aneurysm is found and the patient has cardiovascular instability, then the patient requires immediate surgical consultation. If a patient with abdominal and or back pain has an aneurysm, but lacks cardiovascular instability or direct evidence of bleeding, then an additional imaging study using CT should be considered to better describe the extent of the disease. If a patient has an aneurysm greater than 5 centimeters, but lacks pain and cardiovascular instability, then a surgical consult should be obtained before the patient is discharged. If a patient has an abdominal aortic aneurysm less than 5 centimeters and lacks back pain and cardiovascular instability, then he or she should be followed as an outpatient with serial ultrasound exams of the aorta at regular intervals. Now we're going to talk about aortic dissection. Typically this tends to be a thoracic pathology, but there are cases where this can be seen in the abdominal cavity, so we'll show you some cases of that as well. Although not as sensitive, ultrasound can also visualize abdominal aortic dissection. Risk factors for this disease include hypertension, previous cardiac valvular surgery, a history of tuberculosis or syphilis, connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, or a family history of aortic dissection. The classic symptom for aortic dissection is the sudden onset of tearing or ripping pain in the chest, abdomen, and back. Physical signs associated with aortic dissection include ischemic limbs, stroke, myocardial infarction, or ischemic bowel. There are two classification systems for aortic dissection. The older one is the DeBakey classification system. Those dissections involving both the ascending and descending aorta are referred to as type 1. Those involving only the ascending segment and arch are referred to as type 2, and those involving only the descending segment distal to the left subclavian artery are referred to as type 3. The Stanford classification system is more commonly used today. Those dissections that involve the ascending aorta and or arch, regardless of whether or not they involve the descending segment, are referred to as type A. Those dissections that only involve the descending segment of the aorta distal to the left subclavian artery are referred to as type B. This video demonstrates a longitudinal view of a dissection of the abdominal aorta. Note the dissection flap moving at the anterior aspect of the lumen of the aorta. Here is the transverse view of the abdominal aorta from the same patient as the previous slide. 
it is easy to see the dissection flap in the center of the aortic lumen. This slide is a dramatic video of a longitudinal view of the abdominal aorta with a large dissection. Notice how the false lumen changes in size with each pulsation of blood flow. Here is the transverse view of the abdominal aorta from the same patient as the previous slide. Again, it is easy to see the dissection flap at the center of the lumen. Treatment for dissection depends on the location of the problem. For Stanford type A, involving the ascending aorta and or arch, the risk of catastrophic complications is very high, and therefore the treatment is surgical. For Stanford type B, the risk of surgery outweighs the risk of complications, and the treatment is focused on the medical management of blood pressure and the force of contraction of the heart. So that's the aortic pathology lecture. Now we're going to give you some, some final Probably tips, thoughts. What do you think, Tom? How many should we give them? We'll give them three. Three. We'll give them three. Three. Okay, so I'll give, I think the first one, and my first tip is that this is an easy study to do. It takes very little practice, and you can do this within, I don't know, a couple weeks of training. My point, the second point, is that it's fast. Uh, when time is of the essence, and you've got somebody with a leaking abdominal aortic aneurysm, Ultrasound's the test that's going to get you that diagnosis as quickly as possible. So that leaves me with number three, and I think I would say probably the best thing about this test is it is accurate. So there's been a lot of studies that have shown that using ultrasound to evaluate the abdominal aorta is a very accurate study, as accurate as almost any other imaging modality you can choose.